just in time. That's a train going by. <laughs> Perfect timing, eh? Someone asked me to do a vlog about how it was that I came... <laughs> how it was that I came to choose mobile home living. I live in a mobile home in a trailer park. Which is why my other channel, my cooking channel, is called The Mobile Home Gourmet. If I had to trace it back to a source where it might have started, I would have to say it goes back to when I used to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Many years ago, I was a Jehovah's Witness. And um, technically, I guess they would say I still am because I was never removed. I'm, I'm not disfellowshipped. I didn't disassociate myself, which is ways, which are ways to be no part anymore of the organization. Officially, I'm what they would call inactive because I haven't been to any meetings in 15 years. I don't participate anymore. Anyways, um, one of the things I learned from the Bible back then was that I took to heart and I practiced was that of keeping the eye simple. Having sustenance and covering, we will be content with these things. And I, I lived it. One of the reasons why I, I left the organization was because too many of the others, including the elders, didn't live it. They tried to surround themselves with as much luxury as possible. And if they couldn't afford it, they'd borrow the money. But that's another story. Anyways, I had an opportunity to work as a security guard in a storage facility, which meant that I had to sleep there every night. I could take two weeks off per year, and I could work during the day. But I had to sleep there every night, and I had rounds to do. I had to walk around, make sure that the windows looked all fine and so forth. But I lived in a mobile home, an old ugly wreck almost of a mobile home the roof was rusted a lot i spent a lot of time working on the roof trying to get it waterproof um, but it gave me an opportunity to, to to be humble i thought okay these this is humble abode it's a chance to live a christian principle of keeping my eye simple i've got a roof over my head I've got food, having sustenance and covering. I will be content with these things. And that's when our, where I learned to appreciate somewhat living in a mobile home. It was, wasn't very big, and there wasn't much in there. There was a bureau and a bed f for the bedroom, and the living room was more of a desk. It was like an office. And the desk was my dining room table as well, and there was a small kitchen. Anyways. It, it helped me to appreciate the value of living in a mobile home. I didn't have to pay any rent to live there. And it wasn't a taxable benefit. Like if, if you're hired by somebody and a part of your payment is providing a residence, the value of that residence is considered taxable income. You gotta pay taxes on that. But if that's your job, you have to sleep there. It's not a benefit, it's your job. So it didn't pay very well, but I could work during the day. I, I, I did some retail work. I worked at um, Kmart for a while. I worked in a bookstore for a while. But because I didn't need to spend a lot of money, I wasn't paying rent, I, I saved my money. And eventually the property was sold and the new owner didn't need me to live there anymore. He had his own people. He wanted to put one of his own people in there save some money i don't blame him and he was a nice guy he, even though he gave me very little time to move out like three weeks if i had asked him for more time i know he would have said yes because he was a really nice guy the guy who who, who bought the facility but i didn't have much time like three weeks to find a place to live so i went around to the various trailer parks and would look for for sale signs in the windows and there was usually a phone number i'd call the phone number it was usually an agent the seller, how much are they charging? This is 98,000. They want 89,000. 
This is 120,000. This is 112,000. I mean, they were expensive and they were mobile homes in trailer parks. But the problem is that this is an area where there's a housing shortage. There was a housing moratorium for a while. No new housing was permitted. That's been relaxed a little bit. The other problem was that a lot of wealthy people move into the community and they take up a lot of housing. So there's a housing problem here. I'll get more on that in a bit. So people could ask for a premium for even an old mobile home. There was someone I knew, he and his wife, they wanted to sell their home, but they wanted $83,000 for it. And I looked at it and it was old. It was little better than the one that I lived in at the storage facility. But I was, I was ready to do it. I was ready to do it because I needed a place to live. I was desperate. But someone said, call this real estate agent. Jeff was his name. And I was told Jeff is really good about getting people who are in a bind, getting them into mobile homes. He specializes in selling mobile homes. So I went to see Jeff. And he said, I got a place out there not far from where you live right now here's the key let yourself in and look at it it's a double wide see if it's someplace you want to live it's a repo Re it was uh, repossessed by the bank so i went out and looked at it not bad a double wide i wanted a double wide i wanted the space it's almost like a house a small house two bedroom not big under a thousand square feet but anyways I went back to him and I said, yeah, I like it, but how much? What am I going to have to spend for that thing? He says, how much money do you have in the bank? And I told him, I've got $25,000 in savings. That was money that I had put away while I was working in the other place. Because again, I didn't have to spend a lot of money, so I just saved it in case I needed it for the future. $25,000 in savings. And I said, I got another few six, dollars $7,000 in my checking account. He said, leave that checking account alone because you're going to have to replace the, you have to buy a new refrigerator. There was no refrigerator. You're going to have to replace the stove. There's no furniture. You're going to need to buy some things. Leave $1,000 in your savings account. If I can get this place for you for $24,000, do you want it? <laughs> yeah. Houses, mobile homes rather, that were single wides and worse were two and three, sometimes four times more. So I said, yeah, if you can do it, can you get it for 24? Watch me, he said. Now this is something that's important. If you wanna buy a place, get an agent to work for you. Most of the time when some place is up for sale and you have to contact an agent, the agent works for the seller and the agent is gonna get the best price for the seller. But if you can get an agent working for you, the buyer, the agent will try to get you the best price. So he gets on the phone to Los Angeles and he says, you've got this repo for sale. No one's been interested. You've, it's been there for two or three months. You're paying rent on it. It needs a lot of work. I've got a guy sitting right here in my office. He's got $24,000 cash. He'll buy it today. Oh, no, 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 we, we, we don't. The guy who, who, who owned it owed us $48,000. The story was the guy who had lived here before me, elderly gentleman, had bought an old one, had it pulled out, and then he put in a new one, but a double wide. And it's one of only four double wides in this park because it's an old park. The spaces aren't big enough for double wides, but this space is on a corner. So this Got like, I have like one and a half spaces here. There was plenty of room for a double wide. So he put a double wide in, but he didn't have much money. He was living on social security. He was just paying it off every month, but he passed away. When he got it, got it about halfway paid off. He owed $48,000 on it when he passed away. The family didn't want to be bothered with it. His family, he was unmarried and single, but I mean, his, his relatives, they didn't want to be bothered. They just abandoned it, basically. There was still food inside. Jeff told the bank, there's not even a refrigerator in there. We had to throw the refrigerator out because you guys didn't want to pay, pay for utilities. The bank had owned it when they repoed it. You didn't, you didn't want to pay for utilities. Electricity was shut off. There was food in the refrigerator. It was just a jungle of mold in there. 
It was considered a health hazard. It was ruined. We had to throw the refrigerator away. This place is a mess. You're not going to get $48,000 for it. Let's forget it. Back and forth. They went back and forth, back and forth. Finally, the bank said, all right, if the guy's got $24,000 cash, he can put it in a check. Sold. So on the way home, I stopped at the bank. <laughs> I had a, did a withdrawal, had it written into a, a bank check, a cashier's check at the bank. The next day, I showed up at Jeff's office. I gave him the money, and he started the process, the paperwork. On the first of the following month, I was sleeping here. I owned this place. And it was paid for. No, no loan on it. I bought it outright. I still have to pay rent because it's on a rental space. I don't own the space that it's on. But that's the other half. That's part of the blind good luck. Just good dumb luck. I didn't realize at the time, but I'm in a rent-controlled park. Now, going back to the housing shortage, one of the problems here is there isn't enough housing for the people who work here, the people who work in offices and so forth, because a lot of the houses are bought up by professional people, doctors, lawyers, dentists, and so forth. So the city, in order to try to preserve some affordable housing for the people who work here to reduce some of the traffic because there were so many people who were commuting from out of town north and south that the freeways would be clogged in the morning and in the late afternoon during commute times for some people it could take some days as long as three hours to travel 50 miles to get to work because it was all stop and go traffic so to alleviate some of that and to make some affordable housing for people who work here they enacted rent control. And the way rent control works is every year they can raise the rent 75% of the previous year's cost of living index. So, for example, if the cost of living goes up 2%, they can raise my rent 1.5%. And the longer you live here, over time, the more you save. If I were to sell the place, then under rent control, they can increase the rent 10% for the new owner, and then they fall into that 75% category. And that's how the, the owner gets caught up. So it pays to live here for as long as you can, but that's how rent control works. I'm paying under $700 a month to live here, and that's rent, water, gas, electric, sewer, trash pickup, everything but my phone and my cable, my TV, internet connection. That's about a third of what some people pay for an apartment, a two-bedroom apartment in this town. So that was part of, the, part of the, the blind luck. Some people say rent control isn't fair because it denies the owner of the property an opportunity to make good money, but the park up the street was a problem for a while because that owner went all the way to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, trying to fight rent control. And when the Supreme Court refused to even hear the case, that solidified, finally, rent control here in this town. No lawyer is ever going to challenge it again because it, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The precedent has been set. In some cases, you have people who are greedy. That guy, multimillionaire but he never can get enough. He's never happy with what he has. So he's one of the bad guys. The people who own this park are really nice people. They're really, really, I've met them, talked with them. They're really nice people, very fair people. The manager, the managers we've had, with one exception, has, has well, actually two exceptions. <laughs> one of them was a peeping Tom. <laughs> he was caught looking inside of people's, they caught him because they saw cigarette butts outside the bedroom windows and the people who live there didn't smoke what are these cigarette butts doing here so they started watching and the guy would sit outside the windows smoking looking at the windows <laughs> looking at the women <laughs> you run into a bad egg once in a while but most of the managers we've had here and the current manager they've all been really nice very fair people easy to work with 
um, as long as you live according to the rules. So that's how I ended up in a mobile home. I've done a lot of work on my mobile home. I had all my plumbing replaced a while back. It was old galvanized pipe. It doesn't last for very long. I had it all replaced with brand new copper pipe, real copper pipe, not just copper tubing, but copper pipe, soldered elbows, tees, the whole thing. Had a new shed built. I did all my own landscaping, tore out all the lawn because of the um, the drought here. We're, we're in our sixth year of drought, but we're finally beginning to get some rain here, finally. Our, our reservoir is still more than 90% empty, but at least it's starting to build up again. We're starting to gain some, some water. So I tore out all my lawn so that I wouldn't have to use any water, and it's all stone now, natural sandstone. And then I planted in between, there's little gaps in between, I planted in between um, Daimondia ground cover, which is drought tolerant. It's beautiful. I never have to mow the lawn again. It is so nice. So that's how I ended up in a mobile home. It wasn't something that I wanted to do, but I kind of stumbled into it because I was practicing that principle of trying to live simply, trying to live humbly. It worked out for me. And I got lucky. I got a repo at an unbelievably low price. I could sell this place for $200,000 now. I've been here for over 20 years, especially with the fixing up. New siding, all new vinyl siding, new awnings outside. I've, I had that done as well. So I've done some work on it. But I've always been happy here. One of the reasons why is I have a lot of neighbors very close. If anything happens here, Everybody knows about it. So you never hear about break-ins or robberies here. The people are too close for something like that to happen here. So anyways, to make a long story a little bit shorter, that's how I ended up in a mobile home.